Hello everyone, my name is Janie Koppel and I'm a PhD candidate in the Qualitative Research and, Eva and Evaluation Methodologies program at the University of Georgia. And today I'm going to be sharing a presentation with you on beginning approaches to elicitation and qualitative interviewing. So as this introductory slide indicates, there are various ways to approach elicitation and qualitative interviews. And I wanted to begin with this image to give you a sense of the possibilities in approaching elicitation. Um, I'd like to note at the beginning that this presentation is not intended to be an exhaustive list um, of elicitation techniques or, vari or variations on elicitation methods, but it's intended to particularly provide novice researchers who are new to elicitation and qualitative interviews with um, a, an overall general understanding of some approaches that one might take um, in elicitation in conducting qualitative interviews. So in this presentation, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the ways elicitation has been taken up in qualitative interview studies. I'm going to focus on some elicita elicitation techniques, how they've been approached in interview studies, and conclude um, the presentation with considerations for using elicitation. As seen here, the word elicitation involves drawing out or bringing forth emotions, facts, or opinions. And when we situate elicitation within qualitative interviewing, we're focused on techniques to elicit or to trigger or to evoke responses, memories, stories from our participants. Elicitation has its roots in anthropology, the most common being photo elicitation. So in the early days of anthropology, researchers such as Margaret Mead and Bronislaw Malinowski uh, used photography as data collection in their work. So in this photo, which is housed in the limited online collection of, of Mead's papers in the Library of Congress, we see Mead photographed in the center with who we might assume are participants from her 1925 study on adolescent female sexuality in Samoa. What's important to note here is that photographs at this time were used as documentation tools of researchers in the field. So a way to represent and capture the field um, as, as reality, or the field as it is. In 1957, an anthropologist named John Collier, Jr., who is pictured in the uh, foreground of this photograph, uh, was conducting research with a team on the impact of environmental factors on mental health in the Maritimes in Canada. And it was during this project that Collier experimented with the ways photography might be used in interviewing participants. And in 1957, he published a paper on photography and anthropology in which he coined the term photo elicitation for the first time. And here we see a in this quote from Collier um, about the potential of photography in eliciting participants' responses during interviews. Collier notes um, that the photograph is a restatement of reality, presents life around us in new and objective arresting dimensions, and the idea that it can stimulate the informant in some way to discuss the world about him as if observing for the first time. So if we flash forward over 50 years, um, in 2002, Douglas Harper published an often cited article entitled Talking About Pictures, a Case for Photo Elicitation. In this article, Harper described the potential for photographs to evoke not only deeper information, but different information than interviews um, that use words alone. And Harper expanded the definition here of photo elicitation to include paintings, cartoons, public displays, um, graffiti, billboards, virtually any visual image. And Harper noted that photo elicitation techniques may involve studies in which the researcher or participant takes or provides the photos used during the interview. So notable, notable examples of photo elicitation in qualitative interview research include Clark Ibanez's ethnographic study of two urban elementary schools in South Central Los Angeles. In this study, students were asked to take photographs using disposable cameras of what was important to them um, to help Clark Ibanez better understand the complexity surrounding students' relationships with their communities and homes. Photos were developed, and remember this is back in the day of disposable cameras before uh, digital photography and before uh, phone cameras. 
Um, and, the, and the photographs were developed and used in interviews to facilitate conversations with students um, about their relationships to their communities and homes. So in this article, Clark Ibanez makes the case for participant-generated photos in fostering an inductive approach to understanding lived experience, um, as well as outlines uh, photo elicitation interviewing as methodology. Another example uh, can be found in Allen's 2011 study on sexuality and schooling in New Zealand, where students were given disposable cameras and asked to create a photo diary over seven days around the topic how do you learn about sexuality at school? Interviews asked uh, questions about how students took the photos, how they decided which photos to take, and about challenges um, as well to this approach. And Alan argued um, in the study that photo methods allowed for possibilities to explore more than word discourses about the production of sexuality in schools. And lastly, I want to point to an example of researcher-generated photos in photo elicitation interviewing with Noterman and Commerce study using what they refer to as iconographic elicitation in an ethnographic study on participants' Marian pilgrimages. So participants traveling to um, pilgrimage sites that incorporate statues of the Virgin Mary. So in these elicitation interviews, Participants viewed iconographic images of statues of the Virgin Mary that they had visited in, along in their pilgrimages and responded to questions to do with particular feelings, memories, and stories evoked by the image that was shown. In this article, Noterman and Commerce found that iconographic elicitation methods were an effective way of overcoming the problem of silence um, and the outburst of tears among some participants who were um, emotionally touched during um, interviews that used words alone. So this idea that the iconographic elicitation was able to um, evoke responses um, in interviews where word alone interviews um, were unable to do so. So another approach to elicitation might involve object elicitation, where a participant is either provided or brings an object to an interview and is asked to reflect on the significance of the object as it relates to a particular experience, event, phenomena, or to inquire around the material quality of the object itself. In her article published in 2013, Susan Nordstrom coined the phrase object interviews to understand the, quote, connections family history genealogists made between objects and ancestors. So in a recent conference presentation that uh, Nordstrom gave about, gave around object interviews um, at the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry, she noted that um, without objects, there's not much family history for genealogists to study. And in that presentation, she drew upon her work in this 2013 study that uses Del the Deleuzian concept of the fold to rethink objects and subjects as quote, connective folded entities in the interview space. Material culture scholar Sophie Woodward picked up on the notion of object interviews um, in her interdisciplinary project in which she invited participants to bring a pair of old jeans to explore the ways participants speak the material. In this study, Woodward considered the ways in which genes themselves function in the interview as co-constructors of knowledge and argued for the evocative quality of materiality in bringing form to narratives. And lastly, I mentioned Willock's phenomenological study on participants living with terminal illness. In this study, participants were asked to select objects that held spe uh, special significance during particular phases of their lives, particularly phases of their lives living with terminal illness. Willock argued that ultimately object elicitation allowed for rich multi-sensory details of everyday lived experiences that might have escaped word-only interviews. Other approaches to elicitation might ask the participant to engage in a particular activity during the interview. Timelining, for example, is an effective elicitation tool when asking participants to consider a chronology of events, for example, life history, uh, transformative or milestone experiences, or changing, shifting notions of identity over time. Timelining can look a variety of different ways. Um, uh, 
researcher might ask a participant to simply draw a timeline with um, a rough range of, of dates in, in text format. A researcher might ask a participant to incorporate images, maybe draw out a timeline, maybe cut and paste images into a timeline. There are a lot of different variations on approaches to timelining as elicitation. Collage is another elicitation technique that might be used in connection with timelining or on its own. Participants might be asked to browse magazines, newspapers, uh, print materials for images, words that describe or represent a particular event, emotion, experience, or identities. So one example of using timeline elicitation in qualitative research is Collar and colleagues' study on the use of timeline mapping in studies on resilience among marginalized groups. So researchers examined experiences using timeline mapping across two studies, one with South Asian immigrant women on experiences of domestic violence, and another on street-involved youth who were victims of violence. So researchers examined the ti timeline mapping elicitation across both of the studies and argued that timelining facilitated rapport building, um, it opened space for participants as navigators in the interview, and led to therapeutic moments during semi-structured qualitative interviews. Another example we see here is from Pell and colleagues who used visual timelines in a telephone interview study with participants describing narratives of starting family. Researchers pointed to the importance of timeline elicitation in framing the interview, staying focused on the topic, and also noted that it allowed um, disclosing personal and sensitive experiences more freely in that interview space. And then lastly, I mentioned Vicelli's study using collage making and focus group interviews that examined migration narratives of refugee and asylum-seeking women in the UK. Vicelli situated this study uh, in feminist literature on embodiment to consider how the act of collaging is, quote, reflexivity at work for participants. So some considerations of elicitation and qualitative interviewing include, first and foremost, how you're thinking about elicitation um, as aligned with your research design and theoretical framework. So for example, in my own study um, that explores mothers preparing children for puberty, I invited participants to bring objects that held some significance for mothers, um, for them and their stories of preparing children for puberty, because I was interested in the ways object enga objects engage with mothers in the production of their narratives. Um, if I was, for example, interested in the ways mothers' attitudes towards menstruation or puberty changed across their lifetimes or changed in the course of their journey with their child, um, I might have thought about elicitation, a timeline elicitation as a technique um, in, in that interview space. Um, if I were asking children about their experiences with this sensitive topic, um, I might think with the concept of embodiment and incorporate collage elicitation or a, a combination of collage and timelining. And if I were interested in mothers or children's first period narratives um, in my interviews, I might have chosen to begin with a narrative journaling exercise. So just to give you an idea that um, there are a range of options and ways to play with elicitation and qualitative interviewing. But regardless of what you choose, um, an ongoing consideration in elicitation and qualitative interviewing requires the researcher to remain nimble and flexible during the interview. So both open to where the elicitation might lead, um, perhaps someplace unexpected for you or the participant, while keeping your overall research purpose and questions in mind. So although this presentation only scratches the surface of elicitation um, in qualitative interviews, I hope it's given you some ideas on the ways you might begin to explore elicitation in your own interview research. So I encourage you to play with a couple of techniques and see where they take you. Thank you for listening.